Chapter Forty Five of the Semi Attached Couple by Emily Eden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But Helen wanted no assistance. The tameless energy of eighteen bore her through all the fatigues of broken nights and watchful days, and every hour her husband became dearer to her as she became more necessary to him. His eyes followed her with the tenderest gaze as she moved noiselessly about his room. The hand that brought him refreshment or medicine was warmly pressed to his lips. The fondest words of endearment fell gently from his pallid lips. If she left the room, he could have addressed her in the touching words of one of the best English poetesses. Watch me, O oh, watch me still, through the long night's dreary hours, uphold by thy firm will worn nature's sinking powers, while yet I see thee there, thy loose locks round thee flying, so young and fresh and fair, I feel I am not dying." Helen had expected, from former recollection, that the period of convalescence might be one of impatience and irritation. "'All men are impatient when they are ill,' she thought, "'but somehow I do not think I shall mind it now. I know I can make him follow all Dr. Gray's directions, and that is all that is of real importance, and if he is low and vexed at times, it is only natural, poor fellow." But he never was vexed or cross, which was the word that Helen had sedulously refrained from using, even in her thoughts. Once he was almost peremptory in his orders that she should go to her own room and take one good night's rest, leaving him to the care of the nurse, but he was met by an equally peremptory refusal, and an assertion that a mattress on the floor was the most comfortable bed possible, and he was also told that he was on no account to interfere with the arrangements of the sick-room, but to do what he was told and get well as fast as he could. He only smiled, as he saw that all fear of him had passed away, and in the perfect ease of Helen's manner, amounting to playfulness, when he was well enough to be amused, he felt that the love which he had once doubted and almost driven away was again his own and a quiet rest came over the weary heart which had loved with all the irritation of believing it met with no return. She told him of her hurried journey, of her troubles at the hotel, and insisted on his thinking Laurel Cottage, which could hold only themselves and four servants, the most charming residence in the world. "'My poor Helen, what a quantity of trouble I have given you! But surely you ought not to have been alone at that horrible hotel!' "'I was not.' she said, quite frankly, for she felt that the days of jealousy were over. "'Mary Forrester lives in this neighbourhood, and she came with me, and Beaufort joined us, and was so useful during that first dreadful week, sitting up half the night and writing accounts for you half the day, and making love to Mary at all odd moments, and those two people who had hated each other fell in love on the strength of their mutual interest in your illness. You have made that marriage, dearest simply by the fright you gave us." "'Dear old Beaufort,' said Lord Teviot, "'he is a thorough good fellow. I fancied I had a vision of him one night by my bedside. Helen, I should so like to see him. Am not I well enough?' "'Not quite, dear. To-morrow Dr. Gray thinks you may be moved into the next room, and your servant has ambitious views of shaving you and dressing you up in a splendid dressing-gown. After that I may perhaps allow you to see company on a limited scale, and Beaufort will come down to us whenever you like, but at present he is in London." She did not add that he was there engaged with lawyers on the subject of Harry Lorimer's claims. She was most anxious to keep that worrying history from her husband as long as possible. "'And your mother?' he said. "'I do not suppose there is such another nurse in the world as my dear little wife but still Lady Eskdale must have great qualifications for that office. I should like her to pet me in her soft way, and if she were here you would be satisfied to leave me with her, and go out for a little air and exercise." "'No, I should not. I take plenty of exercise, running about the house in your service. And Mamma is so gentle she would let you commit all sorts of imprudences." She was silent for a few moments and a deep flush spread itself over her drooping face. Then suddenly raising her eyes she said, "'My own darling, I do not wish that any one, not even Mamma, should come between you and me just now.' She threw her arms round him, and with a fond kiss added, "'Teviot, you once thought I did not love you as you loved me, 
You do not think so now, do you? You will never think so again. I was afraid of you, I believe, perhaps at last a little jealous. But you were no sooner gone than I found out that I was very unhappy without you. Then came the news of your illness, and when I saw you in that wretched cabin, dying as I thought, I cannot tell you." And she shuddered as she spoke. "'My utter misery, the remorse I felt at having ever consented to leave you. How wrong I was!' "'No, no!' he interrupted her as he pressed her to his heart. "'I do not wonder you were glad to get away from me. I behaved like an idiot and a brute, and frightened my poor child out of her senses, and expected her to love me all the more for it.' "'Well,' she said, smiling through her tears, "'you have frightened me into them again. The terrors of the last fortnight have been much worse than those of St. Mary's, but they have satisfied me on one point, that when I thought I did not love you more than any other human being, I was only deceiving myself and you. Oh, Teviot, in all your wanderings and sufferings you were so good, so kind! Sometimes I thought my heart would break when you spoke so lovingly of me, not knowing that I was by you. However, this is all over now. I cannot be thankful enough that you have been spared, and now only promise." "'I will promise at once, without being asked, never to distrust my own Helen again. How can I ever doubt your affection?' he said with much emotion. "'When I know that I owe my life under heaven to your devotion. Kiss me once more, my darling, and then I will rest.' and the rest which succeeded this spontaneous avowal of his wife's true affection was the calmest and the most refreshing the invalid had yet known. Helen's mind was not so peaceful. She knew that there was yet a trial in store for him, and one that he would feel deeply. A number of letters were awaiting him, and at last the moment came in which he asked for them. Her hand shook as she gave them, and she said with a faltering voice, "'I hope there will be no bad news in them.' No, he said, I cannot anticipate any to-day. I feel so much better, and it is such a comfort to be by an open window and to breathe the fresh air again. It is so very mild for the time of year that I really wish, Nell, you would go out for a short walk. You ought to have had your carriage sent down, but we shall be moving soon to Teviot House. Will you take your maid and go out? You see, I have plenty of amusement," pointing to the heaps of letters that were lying by him. "'Well, I think I will go out for half an hour, as you do not want me,' said Helen, who dreaded the effect that the first announcement of Mr. Lorimer's pretensions might have on Lord Teviot in his present weak state, and conjectured that he would dislike having any witness of his first emotions. "'I shall not be long away.' When she returned she found him still lying on his sofa, looking exhausted, and with two red, feverish spots on his cheeks. A quantity of opened letters were strewed on the carpet beside him. Others, unopened, were still on the table. She knelt down, and taking his thin hand in hers, said, "'You have been overtiring yourself with those tiresome letters.' "'Perhaps so,' he said dejectedly. "'Do not open any more. Let me look over the others for you.' "'No, no,' he said hastily. "'You should not see them. They are full of vexation.' That is all the more reason why I should, dear Teviot. Do not keep any vexations to yourself. We should bear them better together." "'It was for your sake I did not want you to know what I have heard. My poor Helen, what will you feel, when you know that, in marrying me, you may have married an unconscious impostor? That name and fortune and all—' "'You mean,' she said, looking up at him with a smile, and kissing the hand she held, "'that Harry Lorimer is trying to take it all from us. He means to be Lord Teviot himself. Happily he cannot be my Teviot, whatever happens, and who knows if he will not fail in all the rest." "'Helen,' said Lord Teviot, starting up, "'is it possible that you have heard this story before? How long have you known of it?' "'Before I left Eskdale. And you have had all this anxiety on your mind while you have been working like a slave in your attendance on me, and seeming to have no care but for my health. Why, you foolish old darling! Don't you see that the great care swallowed up the little one? I hardly know how to explain myself, because I can understand that as you have been attached all your life to St. Mary's and Teviot House, and your name and station, it would be a cruel trial to you to lose all this. 
So I did feel at times very unhappy when I thought you had to hear it all as soon as you were strong enough to bear it. But so far as I am concerned, dear Teviot, do not think me unfeeling. But this is not the sort of trial that affects me very deeply." He looked at her and saw that she was speaking from her heart, and not merely with the intention of comforting him, and the suspicions he had once entertained, that it was for his position and not for himself that she had married him, were remembered to be but repented of, and forgotten for ever. He bent his head on hers and whispered, "'My treasure, above all other treasures, whatever happens I am not to be pitied. I have what I have longed for all my life, a real true love to depend on." The subject of the lawsuit once begun, it was of course a constant theme of discussion, but Lord Teviot was too feeble to take any active part even on a point of such moment, and was quite satisfied to know that Lord Eskdale was acting for him, and that Lord Beaufort was staying in London solely that he might be in consultation with the lawyers. The case, as Mr. Larimer's advisers stated it, was a very simple one. Henry, Marcus of Teviot, had two brothers, Robert, the father of this Henry Larimer, who was born, as has always been supposed, before the marriage of his parents, and Alfred, father of the present Lord Teviot. Lord Robert and Lord Alfred both died young, and on the death of Henry, Lord Teviot, the title and estates passed to the heir presumptive, Lord Alfred's son. Henry Lorimer now asserted that he had only recently discovered that his parents were married some months before his birth, and in proof of this he produced a certificate of the marriage of Lord Robert Lorimer to Emma Scott in January 18 blank, and a registry of the birth of their son, Henry Lorimer, in the following August. He could not undertake to explain why he had not once succeeded to the title on his uncle's death, but Lord Robert was on bad terms with his two brothers, owing to the disreputable connection he had made and he had probably never informed them that it had ended in a marriage. Both parents had died nearly at the same time. He had been left, when only three years old, to some of his mother's relations, and he affirmed that it was only on the recent death of the old aunt who had taken charge of him that he had found the certificate of his mother's marriage. All this sounded plausible enough, but Lord Beaufort wrote in good spirits, and said that the lawyers were sanguine, and that there had already been two or three faint offers of a compromise which confirmed them in the idea that Mr. Lorimer had but a weak case, and that they were waiting impatiently for Lord Teviot's return to London, when he would probably be able to direct them in their search for family papers, and point out old servants or friends of the family whose evidence would be important. So Helen sometimes took a very obstinate line of disbelief, at others she would try to make Lord Teviot laugh by the plan she proposed to execute, if they were reduced to poverty, which she of course represented as extreme. Lord Teviot digging and ploughing for his life, and she cooking and ironing for hers, in a picturesque brown stuff gown with short sleeves and white cuffs, and a little pink silk half-handkerchief tied either round her throat or under her chin. She did not know exactly which, but all reduced heroines wore pink silk handkerchiefs. It was de rigueur, after any loss of fortune. Lord Teviot would not, of course, object to the accustomed suit of velveteen. No, he had an old shooting-jacket which would do well enough on ploughing days, but he did not think that at the worst they should be reduced to those extreme straits. Perhaps Helen could sketch out a life for them for a few grades above that. Oh, yes, dear, with the greatest ease. You would not like to keep a shop? Not at all, thank you. Nor I. Could we afford to rent this dear little laurel cottage, Teviot? He nodded. Oh, then nothing can be pleasanter than our prospects. I shall take care of you till you are strong, and walk with you, and we can occasionally afford ourselves a drive in a gig. Phillips does already the work of butler, valet, and footman, and as for Tomkinson, no maid of all work could have worked harder than she has during her illness. Seriously, Teviot, it is very easy to find fault with servants, and to be always abusing them, as most of us do, but when illness or anxiety comes, how kind and thoughtful they are! Those two have been indefatigable in their care for you, keeping the house quiet, running for doctors at all hours, inventing extempore meals, in short, acting like friends." "'Yes,' said Lord Teviot, "'I have observed them. Phillips has been my servant ever since I left school, and I knew his merits. But your little fly-away maid with her curls and graces has quite astonished me. She is so staid and thoughtful and the little woman actually cried when she attempted to make me a congratulatory speech the day I came into this room. 
Of course, we must make them some handsome present, and in the meanwhile there is a parcel of fine lace somewhere amongst my boxes when I collected for you. I dare say we could find something there that would please your Mrs. Tomkins.' "'Tomkinson, dear, she is extremely distressed that you do not know her name, and I believe thinks you might just as well call Mamma Lady Esk.' The parcel was soon found, and when Lord Teviot sent for Mrs. Tomkinson, and addressing her by her proper name, presented her with a beautiful lace shawl, adding his warm thanks for her excellent nursing, she was completely overcome. After rushing up to her room, and taking a long survey of herself, she burst into a flood of tears, and then went down to the kitchen and made up a cup of arrowroot, flavoured with a double allowance of brandy, which she sent up with her duty to his lordship and then returned to her looking-glass, which she visited at every spare moment during the rest of the day, snatching one half-hour for a letter to Mrs. Nelson, in which my lord's convalescence and real guipir, and my lady's goodness and the becomingness of black lace, were much mixed up together. The threatened lawsuit had now got into the newspapers, and become general property. So Mrs. Tomkinson added a fierce postscript, expressing her belief that Mr. Lorimer was a vile imposture and that her hopes was that she should see him hanged for forgery, and she should certainly not wear her black shawl as mourning for him indeed. End of chapter 45 Chapter 46 of The Semi-Attached Couple by Emily Eden This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Owing either to the arrow-root made by the grateful Tomkinson, or the excitement of the lawsuit, or the excellence of Lord Teviot's constitution, his strength returned so rapidly that his removal to Teviot House admitted of no further difficulty. Helen quitted her dear Laurel Cottage with some unwillingness, but was obliged to own, when she reached home, that there were advantages in a large luxurious house which she should be unwilling to forego. Lord Teviot sent his secretary, Mr. Legate, down to St. Mary's, to examine the chests of family papers that had accumulated there and in the meanwhile the foreign affairs in which he had been engaged gave him the occupation to which he was equal. Mr. G. came to see him immediately, entered with sense and friendliness into the affair of the lawsuit, to which, however, he did not attach great importance. He said he had seen too much of life to believe in these sudden discoveries of marriage certificates. A certificate that was worth anything was never missing for five-and-twenty years, and the old aunt, if she were worth anything, would have produced it long before. He felt sorry for whatever might give that perfect angel, Lady Teviot, a moment's anxiety, but was convinced it would be soon ended, and in the meanwhile Lord Teviot must contrive to be well enough to take office before Parliament met. Other acquaintances called, some with the gloomiest faces and forebodings, some with an affectation of considering the point decided in favour of Mr. Lorimer, and taking a degree of modest credit to themselves for still adhering to their poor fallen friends but many with real hearty interest in what they called the real Teviots, and these true friends never vexed Helen by retailing to her any of the ill-natured remarks made by false ones. Lady Portmore's strength of purpose had given way, on the defalcation of one of her corps dramatique, who had been summoned home suddenly, and Harry Lorimer was established as Paul Pry in S, and Lord Teviot in Puss, at Portstown. She wished to make a great mystery of this, but Mr. Lorimer took care to have the playbills of the private theatricals forwarded to the newspapers, and Helen would have been more than mortal if she had not delighted in the scornful smile with which Lord Teviot read the name of H. Lorimer, Esquire, in the list of the brilliant circle assembled at Portsdown. This was the last act of that series of trials which had had the effect of bringing the husband and wife into the closest bonds of confidence and affection. The very next morning Lord Beaufort, who had continued to act for his brother-in-law, rushed into the room with a bundle of papers, the result of Mr. Legate's researches, and docketed by the late Lord Teviot. "'Letters from my brother Lord Robert respecting his marriage.' The last letter, written on his deathbed, from an obscure village on the south coast, announced that his infant heir had followed its mother to the grave, where he himself must shortly join them, and he implored his brother to show some kindness to the unfortunate boy he left behind him. I gave him the Christian name which has always been given to the males in our family, in conjunction with my own, and though he has no legal right to be so called, it is a Harry Lorimer to whom I commend your care. Harry Alfred Lorimer, my second son and heir, has been taken from me, 
and perhaps I have no right to complain that my death will be a loss to none but the unhappy boy who will remain a living proof of my guilt and folly." Enclosed were certificates of his marriage, and of the birth and death of his infant legitimate son. Whether the late Lord Teviot, a selfish, careless man, ever read this letter was doubtful. Certainly he never acted on it, and Harry Larmer grew up ignorant of most of the details of his father's history. Whether he really believed himself to be what he now asserted, or merely made use of the papers he had found on his aunt's death as a good speculation wherewith to extract a sum of money from Lord Teviot, is a mystery that charity may leave unravelled. When his lawyer informed him that the papers which had been found did not leave him a leg to stand on, he observed that he was not surprised, that he had begun life on one leg only, and was only astonished that he had stood so well and so long on it. "'At all events,' he added, "'I have had my fun for my money, and have met with more civility during the last month than during the thirty preceding years of my existence. It is a shabby world to live in.' but I do not mean to let the worshippers of the rising sun who took me up drop me again easily. So I shall go down to Portsdown. I suppose Teviot is not the sort of fellow to come down handsomely with a few thousands because I withdraw my claims. Is he?" The lawyer said he rather thought not, and there ended Harry Lorimer's dreams of grandeur. It had been short and vague, but as he said, rather good fun while it lasted and he thought it would enable him to act Sly the Tinker with considerable verve, if Lady Portmore felt inclined to get up The Taming of the Shrew. End of chapter 46 Chapter 47 of The Semi-Attached Couple by Emily Eden This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Helen, said Lord Teviot, now that this law business is settled, and that I have given G. all my Lisbon information, I think it would be very desirable to get away from this foggy London. I shall never get strong so long as we remain here." "'I am sure you will not,' she said. "'Your doctors are very anxious you should try change of air, indeed so much so that I have made Phillips write some days ago to St. Mary's, to have all your rooms thoroughly aired and to say that we should probably be there in a few days." "'Then, my dear child, you said what is entirely untrue. Certainly you may go to St. Mary's if you have your heart set on it, but I cannot possibly have the honour of accompanying you." "'Oh, Teviot, what do you mean? Why not?' "'Because I have set my heart on going to Eskdale,' he said, smiling. "'I must see your mother and Amelia and all the rest of them again and we shall have the diversion of watching dear old Beaufort making love. I really wonder, Helen, you are not more eager to go and see all our own belongings. I believe you are ashamed of showing your scarecrow of a husband. But I want to go while I am still looking interesting. I am sure your mother will enjoy petting me and making much of me." "'Who would not, you darling?' said Helen, in a transport of delight. Oh, dear, what a happy invention life is, particularly when it has been a little chequered. Just think what a happy Christmas it will be, and how little we could have expected it six weeks ago. Teviot, I sometimes think I am not half grateful enough for all the blessings I have." "'Well, they seem to agree with you,' he said, looking at her with the fondest admiration. "'I shall not be ashamed of showing my wife. I flatter myself, Helen, they will think you even handsomer than you were when you left Eskdale on our wedding day." "'I should think so, indeed,' she said, laughing. "'I hope they will find me improved in all ways,' she added more gravely. "'I was a foolish, spoiled child then, and now I am a happy woman.'" Two days after this conversation a large family party were assembled at Eskdale. Waldgraves, Waldens, Teviots, Ernest, and the reigning hero and heroine, Beaufort and Mary. Lord Teviot's appearance had at first caused considerable alarm in the circle, he looked so thin and pale, but Helen assured them that he was robust now compared to what he had been, and that they would see improvement every day. So they all set about expediting his recovery, Lady Eskdale purring over him, and as he foretold, petting him from morning to night, 
his sisters-in-law ready to amuse him at all hours, and Helen looking on with undisguised satisfaction at the daily improvement in his health, and feeling in her heart the enjoyment he evidently felt in having become a favourite member of a large and affectionate family. "'Yes, this is all very well,' said Ernest one morning when he was sitting with the Teviots and Waldens. "'You all seem very happy and settled, and of course had a perfect right to marry if you chose it. But now here is Beaufort going to set up his little altar to domestic felicity. I thought he would have stuck by me. And here am I, the only one of the family left in solitary grandeur. The last rose of summer, left blooming and lone, all my lovely companions well married and gone. I declare it is very affecting." "'But pleasant for you,' said Lord Teviot, to have so many homes to go to. You know we all like to have you, and you will circulate amongst us without the slightest trouble to yourself." "'Yes, but I think I am getting too old now to be the odd man of the family, the dining out Beaufort. And then, when I come home from one of your well-lit houses, or from my club, it will be very depressing to take out my latch-key and to find a little deplorable lamp in the hall, which makes the whole house smell greasy, and to have to go tumbling up the dark stairs to a darker room. I really wish I were married, too." And so saying, he drew his armchair almost into the fire, and tried to give a deep sigh. "'But why don't you marry?' said Helen. "'My dear soul, how can I? You can't expect me to go rushing about after all those London girls, who care for nothing but balls, and expect to be danced with, and to be handed to carriages standing miles off, and above all to have their cloaks found for them. How I loathe the cloak-room, with number two hundred and ten to be looked for, and of course it is underneath all the other wraps, and there are two hundred and nine bundles to be moved before one gets at it. No. I mean to eschew balls now I have got into Parliament." "'But there are plenty of girls in the country.' "'Vulgar, I fear. And besides, how am I to make acquaintance with them? You can't expect me to go riding about the country, calling at all the neighbours' houses and asking if the young ladies are at home. No, I do not see how I am to find a wife. But you must all of you set about arranging it. Les grands parents always do, you know, in French novels." "'I very much doubt, Ernest,' said Helen, hesitatingly, "'whether you would make a good husband. You will excuse me for mentioning it, but you are rather too selfish—I mean, self-indulgent.' "'Yes, that's just it. I have indulged myself to that degree, that I am, as you mildly observe, Helen, infernally selfish. But then, you know, my wife would be a part of myself, and I should indulge her, and we could both be selfish together.' So do find one for me. And now I must go and take my ride. Who will come?" "'I will,' said Lord Teviot. "'I must try and get back to my old habits. Don't you think I might try a ride, Helen?' "'Decidedly not. You know, dearest, Dr. Gray said you were on no account to go out in an east wind. So I always look at the weathercock the first thing in the morning. It is due east and bitterly cold." "'But he said I was to take exercise. Lord Teviot suggested very humbly. "'Well, then, come and play at billiards with me. As for going out in this weather I can't allow it, love, so don't say any more about it.' "'There,' said Ernest, as Lord Teviot walked off to the billiard-room with his arm round his wife's waist. "'Now that is just what I want, somebody who knows which way the wind blows, and who will tell me what I may or may not do, and will make me stay at home when I want to go out, and vice versa. Just see how it has improved Teviot. He used to look as black as thunder on the slightest contradiction, and now he is the mildest of men, and looks radiant when Helen vouchsafes to snub him. It is strange." "'Not very,' said Amelia. He sees that her whole heart is given up to him, and till he married he never really was cared for by anybody. He had neither mother nor sisters, and the rest of the world only flattered him. Dear little Nell loves him. That makes all the difference, as you will see when Mrs. Ernest appears." "'I suppose it does,' said Ernest, and this time he really sighed, and went off to his solitary ride. It almost seemed as if Lady Eskdale must have overheard the foregoing conversation, for when she returned from her drive she brought Eliza Douglas with her. The great election feud had nearly died out. 
Mr. Douglas had never wished to prolong it, and was in his heart rather pleased with a defeat which left him free to live with his cows and sheep and turnips. And, moreover, he liked the society of the Eskdales, and had a general hatred of neighbourly quarrels. Lord Teviot's dangerous illness had, as was said before, roused Mrs. Douglas's latent tenderness for Helen, and softened her towards Lady Eskdale. She said, indeed, that it might eventually be a great advantage to Helen to get rid of such an ill-tempered man, who was not even what he had pretended to be, probably not Lord Teviot at all, and who, if he lived, would most likely be a pauper. But still there was something melancholy in Helen's story, and she thought it would be only neighbourly to call. And the first step made, the others were not difficult. The visit was returned. Lady Eskdale looked ill and harassed, which put Mrs. Douglas into an extreme good humour. The failure of Mr. Lorimer's pretensions to the title was rather a trial, but Lord Teviot was civil and subdued, and Helen was so radiant with happiness that she was affectionate even to Mrs. Douglas, and altogether the lady was in a better disposition towards the Eskdales than she had been before the election. She had missed them as objects of observation, and had wanted somebody to find fault with. So when Lady Eskdale invited Eliza to return with her to the castle for a few days, no objection was made, and Eliza set off in a most hopeful state of mind. Her extract book, carefully padlocked, accompanied her, and it seemed likely that its gloomy contents might be enlivened with a few sonnets to hope and peace of mind. "'Did you tell my aunt to ask her?' whispered Ernest to Helen, as they sat down to dinner nearly opposite to Eliza. "'Certainly not,' she said, laughing. "'She is a nice little thing, and I shall decidedly interfere if you begin that course of philandering you pursued at St. Mary's.' "'My dear Helen, I do not know what is the feminine of the word philanderer, perhaps philanderess, and I assure you she philanderest with me in the most innocent but decided manner. But I won't begin again till I feel sure of my own honourable intentions.' He, however, occasionally addressed an observation to the opposite side of the table, and during second course observed to Helen that Miss Douglas had a very pretty hand and arm, and by the time that dessert was on the table, said he had made the discovery that she had a good perception of a joke, and smiled intelligently. "'I really think, Helen, I am falling in love. I do not mean in the usual mad, bustling way in which most people set about it, but falling in love very creditably for me. What do you think?" "'That you have not the remotest idea even how to set about it. You are much too worldly and blasé to appreciate or to please such a good, simple-minded girl as that is. But as you are only in jest, it does not much signify." Ernest laughed, but he was very much piqued with Helen's views of the subject, and in the evening he took some pains to make himself agreeable to Eliza but he did not find her so disposed to be amused and interested as she had been at St. Mary's. Mrs. Douglas, with her usual acuteness, had observed all that had passed there, which she thought fully accounted for her daughter's changed spirits since, and before Eliza went to Eskdale, her mother had spoken to her seriously on the subject of Colonel Beaufort's attentions, and without exactly saying that Eliza had invited rather than encouraged them, had desired her upon no account to seek his society and above all to recollect that he was a regular London fine man without any heart and thinking of nothing but his own amusement. In this opinion Eliza did not, of course, concur, but she most conscientiously acted upon it, and was as reserved in her manner as if her mother had been sitting opposite to her, making cutting remarks at and on Ernest. He was rather surprised at first at this change in their relations. Then he became amused at seeing his attentions rebuffed for sometimes he really took the trouble of being attentive after his languid fashion, and finally the slight difficulties placed in his way gave a degree of zest to the pursuit, and Lady Eskdale and her daughters took great delight in watching the activity with which Ernest stepped forward to hand Eliza in to dinner, and the patience with which he listened to her singing, openly avowing that he thought music a mere noise, and a painful interruption to the quiet and comfort of the evening whereupon Eliza, with a strong sense of filial duty, sang and played with additional ardour, and would have considered herself a little martyr, and pitied herself to a great amount, had she not perceived, with the keenness common on such subjects, that Ernest was, in fact, far more really interested in her now than he had been at St. Mary's. 
Page twenty-eight of the extract book, dedicated to the sorrows of the neglected one, was torn out, and Young Hopes, a poem by T, rather trashy but extremely joyous, copied into the next leaf at full length. End of chapter forty-seven. Chapter forty-eight of the semi-attached couple by Emily Eden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I want to talk with you, my dearly beloved aunt," said Ernest one morning, presenting himself at the door of Lady Eskdale's boudoir. I want your advice. What is the matter, my dear? Come in. Are you bilious, Ernest? I hope you have not got a touch of poor Teviot's fever. Oh, no, it is nothing of that sort. Uh, but I am on the point of taking a desperate resolution, and I think your dear, good, soft mind is just the thing for my strong one to lean upon. You see, I make a joke of it to Amelia and Helen. They are so young and energetic. I never was either, but I am seriously thinking of marrying, and of asking Eliza Douglas if she will have me." "'My dear boy said Lady Eskdale, who could not picture to herself life without husband and children, and had never brought herself to believe in the existence of an unhappy marriage. "'How delighted I am! I am excessively fond of that girl. She is what very few people are, perfectly artless, and so thoroughly affectionate.' Lady Eskdale might well make that assertion, for Eliza felt for her that ardent love which girls in early youth often lavish on a woman far above them in age, position, and experience, whose kindness to themselves seems to be a distinction which raises them in their own estimation, and often influences the whole tenor of their after-lives. Lady Eskdale's loving nature gave her this power over many of the young people by whom she was surrounded. They felt sure of her sympathy, that great tie in all the friendships of life, and more especially valued, when it is found in those who are beyond us and before us in the race of life. Her gentle and caressing manner had a peculiar charm for Eliza, who lived in a rather hard atmosphere at home. She was firmly convinced that Lady Eskdale's opinion was infallible, that she was more beautiful in her middle age than the rest of the world in their prime, that her gown was better made, and her cap more becoming than other women's caps and gowns, and that the very happy individual whom Ernest might select as his wife ought to count the blessing of becoming Lady Eskdale's niece one of the brightest ingredients in her lot. Young people may be foolish, perhaps are so generally, but there is something very attractive in the warmth of their grateful little hearts. "'I am very glad you like her, dear,' said Ernest. All Lady Eskdale's entourage called her dear. She seems to me as good a little creature as ever breathed, pretty and ladylike, and so serviceable, never minds what trouble she takes for other people. I think she will suit me exactly. We shall be very happy together." Lady Eskdale laughed. "'My dear Ernest, you amuse me with your cool way of taking that for granted. Eliza is all and much more than you say, for she has great intelligence and tact. Oh, yes, of course, I forgot to mention that. And strong principles, which would lead her to be a good wife even to a bad husband. But she would be a very unhappy wife with a husband who did not care for her. Ernest, I never expect to see you very much in love, though I believe you affect to be colder than you really are. But are you quite sure you can really care enough for my dear little Liz?" Quite sure he said, speaking with more energy and warmth than was his custom. As you say, I am not the sort of fellow who takes a romantic view of things, but the freshness and truth of Miss Douglas's mind have a great charm for me. I see how easily she may be made happy, and I am certain that I could never have for any of the hackneyed conventional set, in which it has been my good fortune to dwell, the same attachment that I have for her. You will see, dear, that we shall be a couple after your own heart." "'You seem to have no doubt that she will accept you,' said Lady Eskdale, smiling. "'None whatever. I suppose I ought to say I have, but you and I have souls above that shallow sort of pretence. And as for Liz—I mean to call her Liz, it is such a nice, short name—she has not a pretence in her. Half the fun of my proposal will be to see her look of delight. She is so easily pleased. That is one of her great merits.' 
Oh, well, my dear Ernest, said Lady Eskdale, who could not help laughing, you know best what will make you happy, and your choice pleases me particularly. But there is one more circumstance to be considered, your future wife's family. Ah, true, he said, that is a consideration. But old Douglas is a thorough gentleman, and I like him. And as for the mother, she won't require me to be extravagantly fond of her, and if she occasionally squeezes a few drops of lemon juice into my stagnant cup, it will be rather an advantage. I shall effervesce. I do not dislike ill-natured women. They are amusing at all events. Besides, a disagreeable mother-in-law is a very common crook in every man's lot, and I generally contrive to make my crooks sit very light. So thank you, dear, for having listened to me so patiently. I will let you know the moment I am engaged." He did not give himself any great trouble to force an opportunity for his proposal, but was really more fidgety and nervous in manner than was usual with him. Lady Eskdale, with apparent carelessness, asked Eliza to fetch her some flowers from the conservatory, and there Ernest followed her, and a very few words on his part joined the destinies of two people as about unlike to each other, in habits, disposition, and sentiments, as they could well be, but not the less likely on that account to be very happy in their married state. Ernest was sincerely charmed with the shy but almost grateful assent given to his declaration by the lady of his love, and he was in an animated state of spirits when he led Eliza back to Lady Eskdale, and said, "'We have forgotten your flowers, dear but I have brought you a new niece, and you must make much of her and coax her, for she is rather nervous, poor little soul." Any deficiency in the art of coaxing could not possibly be attributed to Lady Eskdale, and she soon soothed the agitated girl into composure, and when Eliza had whispered, "'I am so happy, too happy, but I must go to papa and mamma, and you must go with me, my dear kind friend,' the bell was rung, and the carriage ordered and in a short time the lovers and the chaperone were on their way to Thornbank. That the consent of Mr. and Mrs. Douglas was heartily given need not be doubted, and perhaps the most remarkable facts of this remarkable day were, that Colonel Beaufort so little liked the idea of being separated from Liz, that he requested his aunt to send his servant and his things over to Thornbank, and settled himself there, to be fetted and worshipped, without even ascertaining whether the cookery were good, or the spare rooms comfortably furnished. The second fact was that Mrs. Douglas was in a state of such intense felicity that when Lady Eskdale drove off, she observed to Colonel Beaufort, "'How wonderfully handsome your aunt is looking to-day! Even Mr. Douglas, who thought her altered the last time he saw her, must own she looks very young for her age.' Colonel Beaufort's insouciance seemed to have a particular fascination for Mrs. Douglas. It was a novelty in her experience of life. He was so smooth that she ceased to be rough and to Eliza's intense delight she saw her mother, who had seemed for two or three days rather puzzled by his careless way of announcing his intentions, and the deliberate calmness with which he seemed to expect that they would be carried out, gradually yield to his gentlemanlike selfishness. At first with a slight sneer at herself or him, but by degrees she took interest in pleasing him, and felt a degree of pride in seeing a man of such fastidious habits and manners perfectly happy at Thornbank. There is nothing so catching as refinement, and Mrs. Douglas began to act up, as well as she could, to Colonel Beaufort's habit of keeping the surface smooth. His gentle way of ignoring the complaints she was given to make of her servants, neighbours, etc., had a much better effect in checking them than argument or contradiction. And with all his indolence, he was so naturally courteous, that she found herself treated with a degree of easy kindness which few people had ever ventured to show her. It tamed her, and she fell slightly, and with the most perfect propriety, slightly in love with her intended son-in-law, and assured Eliza that she was a very fortunate girl, and once or twice went the length of reproaching her for not attending sufficiently to Ernest's wishes and fancies. This delighted him. "'Poor little Liz, who does nothing but try to please me from morning to night, to be reproached with hard-heartedness! Never mind, dear. I do you perfect justice, and think there never was such a good little angel before on this earth." In his walks with Mr. Douglas a new idea struck him. He had long felt that he ought to live more on his estate, 
but he had always alleged that he fell into a lethargy when he was there, from which he could only be roused by immediate change of scene. But Mr. Douglas's interest in his farm, and his crops, and his labourers, and his cattle, led him to think that a little active occupation, added to the society of his wife, might make a few months, even in Lincolnshire, endurable. "'Liz,' he said one day, after a saunter through the home farm, "'would you like to live in the country?' "'Why, Ernest, I have never lived anywhere else. Of course I should.' "'But, you know, we must be in London during the season.' "'Well, I should enjoy that still more. I have been so little in London.' "'What a child you are for enjoying everything! I declare it is quite refreshing. But what I mean is, that I think we ought, instead of going loitering about during the recess at other people's houses, try to live in that dreary old barracks in the Fens, which calls itself my estate, and rejoices in the cockney name of Belleville, a name evidently derived from Blue Devils, a malady from which I have suffered considerably there. But I think there would be some amusement if I followed your father's example, and took part of the farm into my own hands. And I can help you to keep accounts. I keep all papa's farm books in order." "'No! Do you really?' he said, looking at her with extreme admiration. That takes away my only difficulty. I did not feel up to grappling with account books. But if you will take those in hand, we shall do very well." "'And may I have a school in the village, Ernest? "'Of course, my child. Two or three, if you like. One for boys, and one for girls, and one for adults, as great overgrown men and women choose to call themselves when they want to learn to read. Only don't ask me to come, Liz, to hear them stammer and stumble over their chapters and their sums. Besides, I shall be busy with the farm. I must have some pigsties like your father's. I never saw anything equal to the comfort of those Chinese pigs, all brushed and cleaned, with their eyes obliterated by fat, and lying on their clean beds of straw, quite unequal to the fatigues of standing. I quite envied them. I have tried various amusements without much success, but I am convinced now that my real vocation is for Parliament and pigs. Yes, we will go to our own country place and get your father and mother to come to us. Mrs. Douglas will help you to set up your schools, and your father will superintend the erection of my pigsties, and we shall all be as happy as the day is long." "'I have no doubt of that,' said Eliza. "'And perhaps Lady Eskdale will come and see us. Only think of the pleasure of having her stay with us.' "'Of course she will come,' he said. "'And now we must give your mother a hint to hurry on that trousseau, and then we can all go to Eskdale and our wedding will come off with Beaufort's." And so it was arranged. Mrs. Douglas immediately set to work to execute Ernest's directions, that she would exert her own excellent taste, and make Liz the best-dressed woman in England, with the greatest possible expedition. And, as Mr. Douglas made no objection towards furnishing the necessary means, she found no difficulty in her way. There is little more now to be said of the family whose voracious history has been here given. The cousins were married on the same day, in the chapel at the castle, and on the marriage of her own daughter, Mrs. Douglas made no complaints of the coldness of the pavement, or the glare of the painted windows, and even preserved a total silence on the subject of Lord Eskdale's grey hair. As the two couples drove off, on their respective wedding tours, Amelia turned to Helen and said, "'Well, there is no use in trying to calculate the amount of happiness married people will enjoy from their conduct when they are lovers. There were Walden and I, who both fell in love at first sight. We are happy. Beaufort and Mary began by hating each other. They are happy. In Ernest's case, the love was all on the lady's side. And now, did anybody ever see a man in such a state of felicity as he is? And as to you and Teviot, dear Nell, the love was all on the gentleman's side. And yet, we are decidedly the happiest couple of the four, only that poor Teviot is a little henpecked. Are you not, darling?" "'Not a little,' he said, smiling. "'But I like it. All men do. But the truth is, Amelia, that all you Beauforts have been brought up in a domestic atmosphere. Lord and Lady Eskdale are a model couple and you have been so accustomed to happy homes, that when you are taken from one, you immediately set about making another. And I must own, you succeed. End of chapter 48 End of the semi-attached couple 
by Emily Eden. Read by Elizabeth Clett, in Houston, Texas, November 2012.